Welcome to Michael Potts F1, everything Formula 1 but from a photographer's point of view. Round 21, the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. Apologies in the delay in getting this out to you, but I did need a little bit of time to recover from that triple header. The Brazilian Grand Prix was probably the most hectic race I've ever covered as a Formula 1 photographer. So much happened, and so much of that happened at times when things don't normally happen. Sprint weekends are always quite difficult for us photographers because there's so much that needs to be photographed, and we have a lot less time to do it. I did get caught out on Saturday. The heavens opened, and the FIA suspended the session. When the FIA announced that the session would restart, I went out on track, and I watched the safety car go round and round, and I started to despair every time there was a new 15 minute delay, and I was just standing there getting wetter and wetter. Eventually, the session was called off, and it was announced that a new attempt for qualifying would be made at 7.30 on Sunday morning. This meant I had to be at the track at about 5.30 a.m. Sunday was going to be the longest day in Formula One that I've ever had. But before we go into all the details of the race, I'd like to share some news that's just broken. Gabriel Bortoletto will be racing for Kick Sauber in 2025. He's replacing Valtteri Bottas and Zhou Guan Yu. It's a brilliant signing for the team that will become Audi from 2026. And it's brilliant because this team has missed out on signing their main target from earlier in the year, Carlos Sainz. They've actually landed one of the best future prospects around. Bortoletto won Formula 3 in his rookie year last year, quite impressively winning his first ever feature race in Bahrain, and ended up being 45 points ahead of his nearest rival at the end of the season. The most memorable race so far is the Monza feature race from this year. He started in the last position, but ended up winning the race in a field that included Kimi Antonelli and Oliver Berman. He's now leading Formula 2 with four rounds still to go, and if he can win it, it'll put him in the same league as Charles Leclerc, Oscar Piastri and George Russell. Drivers who've won both Formula 3 and Formula 2 in their first year. But the difference with Bortoletto is he's doing it with a team that have never won the title in Formula 2. Next year, we'll have four juniors going onto the grid at least. There might be more. There's technically one seat open at Racing Bulls, which could potentially go to Liam Lawson or possibly even Franco Carla Pinto, if the rumours are to be believed. If that's the case, it will be an unprecedented year with so many juniors on the starting grid. Valtteri Bottas will join Mercedes as a reserve driver, and Zhou Guan Yu is also looking for a reserve role. It's a sad end for Bottas, who is a multiple race winner, and on his day, he's one of the quickest qualifiers in Formula 1. He's definitely the fastest mullet around. Next year, nearly half the grid will either be new drivers or existing drivers in different teams. And at the start of this year, we had the most settled grid in Formula 1 history with every driver carrying over from the end of last season. But let's go back to the race. Alpine had a weekend beyond their wildest dreams. A double podium finish for a team whose best results so far this season has been ninth. Before the start of the weekend, they were languishing in ninth place in the championship. They were going through loads of internal restructuring pain they had struggled to lure an established driver to replace Esteban Ocon. Things were not looking good. There was talk of selling the team. But then, through the chaos of the Brazil weekend, they outperformed just about everyone on the grid. Ocon put in one of his best qualifying performances to get his car onto fourth place on the grid. He even led the race at one point before eventually finishing second. But in my opinion, it was Gasly starting in 13th and finishing third that put on one of the great drives. It's a huge reward for the team that struggled so much this year, and you could see that in the joy of the celebration after the race. So how much is a result like this actually worth? In terms of prize money, it's probably around $25 million. That's not too bad for two hours work on a Sunday afternoon. The most touching aspect of this result was seeing Pierre and Esteban celebrating together. They have a difficult relationship. They grew up together, they carted in the same series as, as young boys, but then they had a massive falling out. No one really knows the full reasons why. They've kept that to themselves. But seeing them together, celebrating, it was as if they'd gone back in time to before the rift, to the dreams that both these kids had of succeeding in Formula 1. This is Ocon's last season at Enso, and I think it was very important for everyone to have this moment, to, to taste the success. 
But this was a weekend where Lando Norris could have put a serious dent into Max Verstappen's championship league. At one point, it looked like he could take 30 points out of the Dutchman, cutting the deficit to just 17 points with three races and one sprint to go. He benefited from team orders in the sprint where Oscar Piastri let him pass, and it looked like luck was with him when Max was penalised under the virtual safety car, dropping him back a further place in race classification. A Q2 exit for Max in qualifying and a five-place grid penalty for new parts had seen the Red Bull driver drop down to a P17 grid start. It was a mountain for Max to climb just to limit as much damage as possible. This was a race that Lando should have won, but a series of events conspired against him. He lost the lead at the start, but it wasn't that surprising this time because George had already telegraphed the fact that he'd be going aggressive at the start of the race. He isn't fighting for a championship, so he can afford to take a few more risks. But after being overtaken into the first corner, Lando just didn't look like he had a car to attack with. The team had changed his wing to a high downforce version, and that might have robbed him of some of the straight line speed needed to pass his countrymen. It wasn't until the pit stop phase that he could find a way past the Mercedes. For Max, it appeared that his luck had turned. His P17 became effectively P15 when Alex Albans Williams failed to make the start as the mechanics hadn't repaired it from the crash during qualifying. So many cars crashed during qualifying, but Alex was the only one that wasn't able to be repaired on time. Then, Lance Stoll drove his Aston Martin into a sand trap, rather than taking the access road after he went off in the opening lap. Max then produced a masterful start, jumping several cars into the first few corners by positioning himself in a prime position on the exit of the center S's. He then slides through the field, where Norris looked incapable of overtaking. Verstappen was unstoppable. By lap 11, he was up to 6th place. Around halfway through the race, the heavens opened again. I was sort of undercover, but I got soaking wet because it was atrocious conditions out there. I could hardly see the cars, there was so much water. There were large pools of standing water on the track, with rivers flowing across the strait in some places. It was treacherous. Hulkenberg and beached right near me. He actually ended up using my photo on his Instagram post talking about the weekend. But this incident triggered the virtual safety car. With the rain intensifying, that was upgraded to a full safety car. And George and Lando came into the pits to change their worn inters. Yuki was flying on full wets, and Max and Ocon had rolled the dice and stayed out, hoping for a red flag. That duly came. Franco Carlopinto lost control and slammed into the barrier causing the race to be suspended, and all drivers were given a chance to change their tyres. Now, this rule has come in for a lot of criticism. It is essential for the race because you do need to allow drivers the option to be able to change their tyres. If there was an incident, there might be carbon fibre on the track, and this could cause a puncture. So for safety reasons, when they stop the race, they do need to give drivers a chance to change their tyres. However, the advantage it gives you is massive. It's about 30 seconds to complete a pit stop at Interlagos. The drivers that stayed out, such as Max and Ocon, got a massive advantage. And the drivers that did the right thing, that changed tyres for the conditions, such as Yuki Tsunoda, who was flying, and probably if there wasn't a red flag, could have won the race, he actually got penalised because of this law. And this is why this rule isn't great, because it encourages drivers to stay out in dangerous conditions on tyres that just aren't up to standard, because they know that there's such a big advantage if a red flag is called. Just take a look at the tread on Max's 30 lap old tyres, compared to George's brand new Inters. These drivers are taking a huge risk, and it is very, very dangerous. One thing they could do to mitigate this is require that all drivers make at least one stop during the race. We have this in dry conditions because there are three different tyre compounds. That's not the case in wet weather racing where there's only inters and full wets, and you should be using the right one for the conditions. So it would be unfair to ask a driver to drive in full wet conditions in inters just to obey this rule, but you could still have one mandatory stop so that no one is getting an advantage, and that might go some way to lessen the power of the red flag tyre change rule. Max went all in betting there would be a red flag. Had Franco not spun, and the cars continued for five or six laps behind the safety car, the heavy rain actually ended quite quickly, Max would have needed to stop and probably would have ended up last, or at least at the back with the Alpines, and the story of the race would have been entirely different. Taking that gamble that a red flag was likely has all but won him his fourth title. 
It is interesting that Max's two world titles have come as a direct result of the second Williams car crashing and changing the outcome of the race. Max did drive brilliantly, he gambled audaciously and it all came off perfectly. McLaren were conservative with their downforce choice, Norris was tentative at the start, and the team were risk adverse when it came to the pit stops. They did everything right not to lose the race, but Red Bull did everything right to win it. Just one further point, I haven't seen a, a Red Bull podium this ecstatic for quite a long time. But what was more interesting to see was the relationship between Christian Horner and Helmut Marko. Even those two were ecstatic with the result. Thank you so much for joining me for this look back over Sao Paulo Grand Prix. I really do hope you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to see some more photographs from the race, there's a link in the description below. There was a lot that happened that I haven't covered. There was sprint qualifying, sprint race, normal qualifying, lots of crashes. A lot of that's in there, so, so do have a look. If you haven't yet and you'd like to see some more Formula 1 content, please do like and subscribe. I'm currently in Buenos Aires working on a piece about who is Franco Carlo Pinto, so stay tuned for that. Next race will be the Las Vegas Grand Prix. So until then, goodbye. <laughs>